Welcome to episode 5 of my Kawasaki S1 554 cylinder engine build. I'm just up in the shed getting the gearbox bits and the clutch parts so I can put the bottom end of the engine together. I'd already cleaned all the parts so they're ready to take back to my garage to start the assembly. So the first thing I need to do is go through all the parts and sort out the bits for the selector mechanism because they're the first thing that go into the upper crankcase. With the selector mechanism parts identified, I put them in a separate tin because the first thing I need to do is put in the main selector drum and the first selector fork. I give the parts a quick wipe down with a bit of cloth just to make sure there's no bits left on there and then try the selector fork onto the drum and it fits just nice. So it's all ready for assembly into the upper crankcase. The selector drum slides into the crankcase and you have to engage the selector fork as it goes. But first I'll put a bit of oil on there just to help it on its way. The next bit is a bit fiddly. You have to put this little tiny dowel in that's got a hole in for a split pin and it engages the main selector fork with the selector drum. Once the little dowel is in and selected into the groove, you put a split pin in and bend over one of the tangs with a screwdriver. The next thing to do is to fit the two rear selectors. These are held on a shaft that pushes through the crankcase. You have to engage the selectors as you go. First the first one and engage it into the groove, then the second one and engage it into the groove. And with the two selectors in place, the last thing you need to do is put on a circlip at the end that holds the shaft in place. This snaps on quite easily. Then you can push the shaft finally home until the circlip hits the crankcase. And that's basically the rear selectors in. So now we can put on the retaining plate for the selector drum. The retaining plate is held in place with two screws. You have to rotate the selector drum to get the screws in. And when they're done up tight, you use a centre punch to punch them in place so they don't come undone. The next thing to do is to fit the metal oil deflector, the screws onto the side of the crankcase with one screw. Then, followed by the indent device that goes onto the side of the crankcase that engages with a selector drum, this is what makes it stay into gear. The screw has a stepped shoulder and it's a bit of a wriggle to get it to line up with both the holes at the same time with the spring tension, but you have to give it a wriggle and keep persevering and eventually you get there and then you can do the screw up really tight. Before I go any further, I just check that the selector drum rotates nicely and clicks into all the gears, and it does. So now I can fit the kickstart return stop screw, but only flush with the side of the crankcases, so I'll explain later. The next thing I need to do is to fit a new oil seal to the output transmission shaft. So first I put on a little bit of oil to help it on its way. With the seal fitted, I then fit the bearing retaining C-clip into the crankcases. Now I can fit the output shaft, locating the bearing onto the C-clip and rotating a little bearing on the other end until the pin lines up with a hole and it drops down in place with a snap. I just checked the selectors engaged nicely with the gear and it rotates okay, it does. So now I can fit the front transmission shaft, engaging the C-ring groove and the hole just like the rear one. And it all rotates nicely, so I'm really pleased with that. With the transmission shafts fitted, I can now fit a new clutch pushrod seal. The next thing to put in is the kickstart assembly. This fits at the rear of the crankcases. And it's important to check that when you rotate it, the gear slides backwards and forwards to engage with the front transmission gear. At this point in the build, I always check the gears work and I can select all the gears and they all work perfect. So I'm really pleased with that. So now I can drop in the crankshaft. The crankshaft drops straight down onto its C groove to locate it in place longitudinally and looks amazing in the new engine. Well now it's time to cover up all the parts and fit the bottom crankcase, so I first go around with some gasket sealer. This can take quite a while and it's really important not to miss any bits otherwise you're going to get a leak, especially around the stud holes because oil can run down the stud holes and drip off the bottom of the engine. 
I then put a drop of bearing retainer on each bearing and lower the crankcases down, pushing it down firm onto the gasket sealer. Sometimes it needs a little rubber mallet just to make sure it's down home, and it is now, so that's really good. So now I can put all the washers on and the nuts and tighten them up. I fit and tighten all the nuts by hand first, just to make sure they're all there, then go around my socket to tighten them up. I use my quarter drive T-wrench for the smaller M6 nuts. At this critical stage, even Charlie Weaver comes forward to watch to make sure I do them up properly and don't miss one. With all the nuts tight, I turn the crankcases over and they look really nice and the crankshaft rotates nice and smooth and I'm really pleased with that. So the next thing I need to do is set up the kickstart mechanism. So I put a bit of protective sleeve on the shaft, grip it with some oil grips and rotate it about 180 degrees. And then I do up the kickstart return stop until it engages nicely with the kickstart mechanism. With the kickstart mechanism tested, I do up the screw really tight with my socket. Then I fit the rear transmission shaft oil injector. This collects oil from the clutch and sprays it into the gearbox shaft, lubricating the gears. It's now time to fit the extended gear change shaft. I showed you how I made this in the previous video. This engages with the selector drum and allows you to change gear. And before I go any further, I check that the selector drum actually works with the selector shaft. It's really important when you're building engines that you check all the systems as you go along, otherwise you end up with a completely built engine and you can't get first gear, and that's a real pain. The plastic gearbox breather pushes into the back of the crankcases. It's a really tight fit and you usually have to hammer it in place. The next thing I need to do is fit the neutral switch. This is very delicate and it screws on top of the engine with one screw which you must tighten tight, but not too tight, otherwise you'll crack it. I then put the little Woodruff key into the crankshaft stub on the left-hand side, and then put on the magnet rotor. The Woodruff key holds the magnet rotor in the correct place for the timing later on, so I secure the bolt in the centre to hold it on tight. With the rotor fitted, I can easily turn the crankshaft, so this is really good. So now, I'm going to fit the clutch operating mechanism. It can be a bit fiddly to get it in and engage nicely, and it's held in with two screws. It's now time to fit the extender gearbox sprocket and outrigger bearing. I showed you how I made these in an earlier video. To make the nut easier to fit, I stuffed a bit of paper into the socket to stop it from going right to the end of the socket, and then it'll engage with the thread easier. I then lock the rotation of the sprocket by putting a socket in between the back of the crankcases and the teeth of the sprocket. Then I can do it up really tight without causing any harm to the gearbox internals. The outrigger support bearing and its bracket slide straight into the sprocket nicely and line up with the two holes I pre-drilled in the crankcases. I tighten the two screws with my Allen key, then rotate the engine round to work on the other side. The next thing I need to do is fit the clutch. So I put the clutch thrust washer on with a bit of oil and the clutch in a bearing sleeve. I then offer up and fit the clutch basket, making sure it engages nicely with the front sprocket teeth and fit the inner thrust washer, followed by the inner basket. The central nut has a tab washer that engages with a hole in the clutch inner basket. It's important this engages nicely. And then I can screw on the nut. It's hard to do up the central nut tight whilst the inner basket rotates, so I made up a special tool using an old clutch plate and an M8 bolt. I first cut away half of the head of the bolt using my hacksaw. I like using my hacksaw. Then I remove all the burrs and sharp edges with my file. With the burrs removed, I can now weld this to the inner clutch plate with my TIG welder. 
I allow the world to cool down and then I can use this to lock the inner clutch hub whilst I do up the nut tight with my socket. With the centre nut tight, I can now bend up the tab washer with my screwdriver. Then I use my pliers to squeeze it up tight against the side of the nut. The clutch push rod slides into the centre of the clutch main shaft, followed by the mushroom. And before I go any further, I check that it works by operating the clutch operating mechanism to see that it goes in and out, and it does, so now I can fit the clutch plates. The clutch is fitted with these wire springs that go between the friction plates and the steel plates. They help the clutch disengage when you pull the lever in. With the last clutch plate fitted, I can fit the outer cover and the five retaining springs and screws. With all the screws tightened, I check the clutch works by using a spanner on the clutch operating mechanism and it works great. I'm really pleased with that. I'm now ready to fit the clutch cover. Before I can do that, I need to make a gasket. I've covered this process in previous videos, but I thought I'd cover it again here. The first thing I do is draw around the outside of the clutch cover with my pencil. Then use a screwdriver to mark the centre of the holes. Pressing down firmly to make sure a good indentation is made in the gasket paper. I also mark around the inner oil pump cavity. Well there it is all marked out, so the next thing I'm going to do is punch the holes while the paper is still large. If you try and punch the holes after you've cut the gasket, it just splits the paper. The punches work really well and cut clean through the gasket paper. With all the holes punched, the next thing I do is cut around the outside with my pen knife scissors. I find these pen knife scissors really easy to use and ideal for cutting out gaskets. With the outside of the gasket cut out, I replace it back on the clutch cover and put the screws in. Then I can rub my thumb around to mark the inside area I need to cut. By pressing hard with your thumb, it makes an indentation on the gasket paper that you can see on the rear. Then you just simply cut out with your scissors. It starts to get really fiddly when it gets thin, but you have to be careful. You don't want to slip and cut through the gasket, otherwise you have to start all over again. And there we go, the finished gasket, all ready to fit, and it fits perfect. This clutch cover could do with a bit of a polish, so I'm first going to rub it up with some 800 grey wet and dry, then go up to my shed and give it a good buff up on my buffer. I carefully grip the clutch cover in my vise using aluminium soft jaws so I can pay particular attention to the top surface which has quite a few deep scratches but after a while they're all gone and it's starting to look quite smooth so I take the clutch cover plus the other covers up to my shed to give them a good buff up on my buffer. As I'm walking up the garden I look across and the pigeons are having a right flap around and then they do synchronised waddling. Very strange. I go in my shed and start the buffing process. It's really therapeutic buffing aluminium, watching the shine appear in front of your very eyes. After about half an hour or so of buffing, I apply some fresh soap and carry on with the clutch cover. It doesn't take long before a lovely sheen is achieved. With the buffing complete, I walk back to the house and as I go past the kitchen and look in the window, Tracy's doing some cooking. So going to see what she's cooking this time in its Christmas mincemeat flapjack. She's just put some butter in the pan, followed by some sugar, then some golden syrup dolloped in on a spoon, about four of them, just right. Then she mixes it all up in the pan to a nice creamy paste and adds oats, lots of them, so many. I didn't think it'd ever work, but it did, and it all mixed up really nice in the end. She then spoons out about half the mixture into a greaseproof tray and then pats it down with a red spoon till it's all smooth and then adds a layer of mincemeat, lots of it which is then smoothed out with a, like a trowel thing. Then she adds more flapjack afterwards with the red spoon and smooths that all out. And here is a Christmas cake that Tracy's dad made. It is so nice. And that's why we're making flapjack and not Christmas cake. 
The flapjack goes in the oven for about 45 minutes and when it comes out, it's golden brown and looks just amazing. So she cuts it up into slices and I have to pinch one to try and it was so nice. So now, back in the garage, I'm fitting a new oil seal to the clutch cover. I've bought OEM spec steel rimmed seals. They're a really tight fit in the case, but a gentle tap with a hammer and they're soon in flush. Well now I'm all ready to fit the clutch cover, so I first fit the gasket, locating it on the dowels, then put a bit of oil on the kickstart seal and place the cover gently over the kickstart shaft, being careful not to damage the seal, and it snaps in place tight. Then I can put in all the screws and tighten them up. I always prefer to use original specification JIS screws in my engine builds. If you use the correct JIS screwdriver, you can tighten them just as tight as cap heads and they look so much nicer. With all the screws tightened, I can replace the oil filler cap, which just screws in tight against the rubber seal. I'll put oil in it later on when the gasket seal has hardened off after a couple of days. I can now turn the engine around to work on the other side. I need to look at the alternator, but the first thing I'm going to do is check that it's actually OK and the windings aren't damaged. There should be a closed circuit between the three wires that come out of the alternator, which I'll be checking with my vintage AVO meter, set to resistance. I set both knobs to resistance, then attach the test leads up to the wires, and all three wires are continuous circuit, so that's great. The second test I do is go between each wire individually and the outside casing of the alternator winding, and there should be no current flowing, open circuit, which it was. That means this is a good alternator to use. The next thing I do is make up a loom for the four wires for the recondition points, one for each cylinder, and route them through the windings and out where the wires will go. I mount condensers on the back of the engine eventually. It's always a good idea to leave the wires a bit long, because you can always trim them down, but you can't add to them. And then I use my blowtorch to heat shrink the shrink down to make it tight on the wires. I then reinstall the alternator windings into the alternator casing and line the wires up with the exit point. I then fit the front cover plate, feeding the wires through one of the slots and aligning the three screw holes, then I can turn it over and put the three screws in the back. These screw through and hold the coil bindings into place. With the three rear screws in place, I turn it over and put in the three front screws. I'm now ready to fit the alternator casing onto the engine, but first I insert the gasket behind the wires and seat it down nicely. Then it slips straight onto the engine over the magnet and snaps into place. I then tighten the three screws. With the alternator fitted, I trial fit the sprocket cover that I made in the previous video and line up the wires and it fits just perfect. I'm really pleased with that. So now I can put in the screws. With all the screws in, I turn the engine around for a look and it looks really good. I'm really pleased the bottom end has come together nicely and I'm really looking forward to building the top end. The barrels and cylinder heads are all vapour blasted ready and I ordered a new set of pistons from Japan. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm really pleased how the end is turning out so far. I've just had four cylinders vapour blasted, so in the next video, I'll show you how to do the rebores, fit the new pistons, and fit the barrels and heads to the engine.